Welcome to the University of Miami, and thank you very much for joining us for this healthcare conference. We've been longtime friends, and I was just delighted when I knew that we had an opportunity to bring you here. Well, thank you, Donna, and I'm, I can't tell you how privileged it is to be here today uh, with my friend Donna, who, as you all know, has done spectacular work in every sphere for every institution that she's worked for. And we were blessed in Washington to have her as Secretary of Health and Human Services, and I had the chance uh, to work with Donna on some of the critical issues at the time was welfare reform, uh, children's health insurance, uh, which was an incredible program that's so important for children all across America, and immunization, and of course, many issues related to health care reform that we're even uh, discussing here today. She, she was a groundbreaking uh, leader in all respects, and the can-do person, the type of personality and manager we need in Washington. Yeah. Are you running? No, 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 no. Thank you. But, uh, you know, you come from an interesting state, and um, uh, we were talking earlier about Margaret Chase Smith. And I was yes. wondering, uh, did Maine give you, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the senator's very important book, Fighting Common Ground. For those of you that haven't bought it yet, please do. Uh, it's an absolutely first-rate book. Um, that is positive about the future, and I think that's very important. We're reading so many of these political books that, I mean, you need a pill afterwards. <laughs> uh, I suppose that's not bad for the pharmaceutical industry, but... Um, and I think that's important. I always wanted to ask you, does Maine give you uh, a little more independence than maybe being from a state like New York? Well, you know, it's interesting about Maine. Maine, um, for a very uh, small state, um, is, has really placed a premium on the value of independence. So it's more about the notion of being independent, doing what is right, you know, for your country, for your state, and for your party in that order. They expect independence from their elected officials. And that certainly comes down in many ways uh, from the legacy and tradition of, of the late Senator Margaret Chase Smith. Because as I was uh, telling Donna, think about it. Even by today's standards, it would be extraordinary that in her second year in the United States Senate, so she's a freshman senator, in 1950, the only woman in the United States Senate and she is the only one uh, to stand up and denounce Joe McCarthy and repudiate, you know, his tactics of demagoguery. So she, she did what 94 of her male colleagues, I might add, did not dare to do. And he was a fellow Republican. And she In fact, they were hiding under their, uh, oh, under their desk. They were hiding. That's exactly right. Living in fear. And she delivered uh, what was described as an iconic a declaration of conscience speech. And that speech and her ability to transmit so much courage really has been a legacy and a hallmark in Maine politics. And so people expect you to exhibit that same kind of independence. They want you to do what you think is right, not what's right for your party or any other political or ideological interests. So it does help. In fact, yes. um, there have been very few instances of that level of courage. I always said that um, that's why Profiles in Courage is such a short book. That's right. <laughs> um, let's talk a little about one of the interesting chapters, most interesting chapters to me, of course, in Fighting for Common Good, is the fact that even though we talk about the Accountable Care Act as um, passed just by Democrats, that it actually, the debate and the discussion started out in a bipartisan manner, which you participated in. Yeah. Will you talk about that? Because for many of us, the great weakness of taking giant steps is that they need to be bipartisan. Well, that's and correct. Saying. And certainly on an initiative of this magnitude, which would simply the largest domestic initiative in the history of our country, given the scope and the complexity uh, and certainly the size. But actually, 
It, the discussions regarding health care reform started perhaps back in 2007, when in fact the chair of the committee, Senator Max Baucus, had indicated his interest in moving in that direction. And in 2000, and we had multiple hearings uh, during the course of that time um, on various facets of health care. Then at the beginning of 2009, he indicated that in fact he wanted uh, to make that the priority on his agenda in the Senate Finance Committee and began the process of assembling, in addition to hearings, round tables, convening stakeholders in, in various dimensions of the healthcare uh, sector, uh, bringing them together for informal discussions, because round tables are more you know, informal than a formal hearing. Uh, and we sat around the table and had these very intense discussions in probing one another on these various questions, bringing experts in on all sides and all facets of an issue. And so that was a preparatory work. And then ultimately, by April, he decided, the chairman, to convene what was called the Gang of Six. Now, I don't know why they name everybody after gangs in Congress. I'll leave that up to your own imagination. But they had three Democrats and three Republicans from the Finance Committee, and I happen to be one of the three Republicans. The other two were uh, the ranking member Chuck Grassley and Mike Enzi, the senator from Wyoming. And we proceeded, we had 31 meetings over the course of four months really delving into the issues. It wasn't about politics. In fact, the politics never arose in our discussions. It was every dimension of health care. And it went that way for a while until about August when you had those infamous uh, town meetings. And uh, they became a lightning rod, you know, for the entire issue and death panels, the question of whether or not there were death panels. And there were so many bills at that point that people were becoming confused about which bills had what in, in both the House and the Senate. And we had yet to conclude our deliberations. There was pressure on us to conclude those deliberations. And people in the press was asking, well, why is it taking so much time? I said, anybody who asks, why is it taking so much time when it comes to health care, then clearly doesn't understand health care. I mean, obviously, even a Medicare took more than a year and a half to work it through Congress at the time because of the complexity and the issue itself. In any event, August came, and we, re we recessed, and we still had our conference calls. Not one of us ever missed a conference call or any one of those 31 meetings. That was in addition to our staff. So that's how we laid the groundwork. But by fall, we got the edict from the majority leader that we had, the deadline had now been reached and that the Finance Committee had to hold a markup, even though we hadn't completed our work in the committee. So the markup began towards, I think, the end of September and went to Max's credit for, 20, you know, for seven days, at least seven days, we had more than 500 amendments. It was an open, transparent process. And I ended up being the only Republican uh, to vote for it because I said my vote that day was my vote that day. But I wanted to keep the process open, predicated on the hope that we could build bipartisan support, have an open amendment process, and to address some of the issues that were in there. But at least for that part of it, it was an open, transparent, and bipartisan attempt to the, to the chairman's credit. I always say that after the Finance Committee uh, deliberations, the wheels came off. And, and what's the explanation for why the wheels came off you then? Know, it's a very good question. I've never quite understood exactly what happened, but the expectation was, and I was you know, certainly told, that we would have an open amendment process on the floor of the Senate. Because that's exactly what I discussed in my statement in the Finance Committee. That, you know, we, on an issue of this size, that you can't drive it by, you know, a partisan and one vote margin strategy. You had to have both sides having a stake in the process to make, you know, to have all eyes on the legislation. But unfortunately, the whole impetus after the Finance Committee's deliberation was to get that one vote, to get it across the transom, you know, with, with support, and get it out of the Senate. So what happened was, when they didn't have the votes, is that 
it didn't come before the Senate. Instead of allowing the amendment process to take hold, it went behind closed doors. They took the Finance Committee product and what was in the Health, the health Education Labor Committee had jurisdiction, so they had portions of it, put it together. So what was a 1,200-page bill became a 2,700-page bill. And in the meantime, the effort was concentrated. Okay, what changes or what can we add to do something to get somebody's vote as opposed to trying to sit down and have it out there, everybody having a look at it and see how you could improve it and to broaden the support and scaling it back and bringing both sides together. That simply didn't happen. I think the whole pressure was just to get the 60 votes and get it out. And I met with the president on numerous occasions and had conversations with him and so many others. Um, and making a, an array of recommendations, but unfortunately they just didn't come to fruition. I, I believe there was just so much in that package at the time that was unknown. For example, I wanted an affordability study. I wanted the Congressional Budget Office, before we could would vote on it, to have an idea of what the cost of the premiums, the co-pays, the deductibles, what were the assumptions that were going to be considered you know, or would have to occur uh, for, you know, these plans to be affordable. And would they be affordable? And we should have a state-by-state -state analysis. I think in that way we would have gleaned a lot more about what assumptions they were making about how these exchanges would work. I had a number of issues that I could go on the list, but unfortunately we didn't have the process, Donna. The United States Senate is about building consensus. It's not my way or the highway. That's not the way the Founding Fathers made it. They designed it based on majority rule, but bringing both sides together. The amendment process is the way you do it. You know how many amendments we ended up having on a 2,700-page bill? When it finally came to the floor, which was the end of November, the beginning of December? Two dozen. Two dozen amendments. I mean, in seven days in Finance Committee, we had over 100 that were incorporated, another almost cl close to 200 considered and then there were overall 500, and yet only two dozen, then it stalled, and then we got a 400-page amendment on, this, uh, uh, on Christmas Eve day was the final vote. The week before, we had a 400-page amendment that we got the day before, and we had to vote on it with no amendments. So you can understand exactly what happened and how it all went awry and the problems that are out there today, which is what I you know, had anticipated. I encouraged them to you know, maybe take a time out and scale it back. Uh, and encourage the president to do that. And let's, you know, over the, re over the holidays and build a bipartisan group and see what we could do to be more practical than what occurred. But at the end of the day, when you're trying to take a giant step in social policy, the debate in Washington is about whether government should do this. Whether, and in many ways, the presidential campaigns right. are the same way. There are a debate about federalism, whether this is something that uh, the federal government should do. What do you think the main elements, in addition to the process problems, right. there were serious right. process problems, what would have brought more Republicans um, into the bill? Was it scale or were there really fundamental kinds of objections to expanding the role of government? What's your sense of that? Well, you know, it's interesting um, because of the way in which it got, you know, w the way it was initiated in the Finance Committee, I thought it was promising uh, to have both, uh, you know, the ranking member Chuck Grassley and Mike Enzi. That was, you know, in order to, le uh, to legislate a bipartisan initiative. But, you know, really, if I think about it, going back at that point, you know, on our side, there didn't seem to be a whole lot of interest in delving in the direction in which the Finance Committee product was going to begin with, that it was already, in their view, somewhat too much government. I think, you know, for example, um, on small businesses, um, which is half of all the uninsured in this country, it might have been a way to start at that point, you know, to build support, to have, you know, tax credits for example, something on a perhaps a more modest scale that obviously would have conflicted with the other side, who now, frankly, you know, the president and his party, the Democratic Party, 
had both the House and the Senate. They had 60 votes in the Senate. They had the majority in the, in the House, plus the presidency, and felt, I think, considerable pressure to, to drive this agenda. So the, I think the gap was already there. Frankly, when, I, when we were in control of Congress, I was chair of the Small Business Committee. I wanted to address that question at that point on small businesses. And I often thought, and we had resistance even on my side, even on that issue. I always felt that we had an obligation to address the issue of the uninsured. And that frankly, we had to address, you know, to confront it in some fashion. But I don't even think that the consensus was there to even to begin to grapple with this issue. We had a task force, and I was on it, you know, during the time of the majority, but nothing came to fruition. That's a pretty dramatic statement it, yeah. because it suggests that yeah. expanding the role of government is a pretty fundamental difference between right. the two parties. Um, but we still have to hold government accountable. Right. So there's nothing, if you had to go back and do the bill and try to do that bipartisan bill, mm -hmm. would you have started smaller? I mean, yes. you know that Senate right. as well as anyone does. Well, you know, the interesting, well, in fact, is back in 2005, I, I was talking about opening up, you know, line, you know the, allowing small businesses to purchase plans across state lines. In fact, how bipartisanship worked, when I first offered that, and there was strong opposition, even on my side on that notion, that ultimately um, a whole group got together, including Dick Durbin, who you know was, is now the majority whip in, in the United States Senate. We had all groups on both sides, from you know the chamber to the unions to the state insurance commissions and so on, who came together in creating regional areas where small businesses from different states could merge and buy insurance plans to leverage their purchasing power because they didn't have the volume. That was 2000. I introduced that. It was started in 2003, and then uh, Senator Durbin and I and Blanche Link, it was a bipartisan initiative, had broad support. We offered it. It was on the floor of the Senate for a week in 2005, and we couldn't overcome the differences both on, my, on the Republican side as well as on the Democratic side because they also wanted mandated benefits at a certain level, and we just couldn't, reach, couldn't reconcile those differences. So yes, it probably should have been, you know, maybe much smaller, and maybe there should have been a, a, a framework developed between the leaders, the president, the White House to be, has to be directly engaged in that, and the president, because this was his major initiative, and the co committees of jurisdiction to try to sketch out what's possible in initial discussions before you launch out there and try to draft the initiative. And that's probably bringing in all the key people first. And that would include the president, the White House, and the leadership, and the committee chairs. Has politics, um, let me ask about smoky back rooms. Because when Lyndon Johnson pushed through Medicare, I, I realize you and I would never be invited into those places. But, but when Lyndon Johnson, if you read the history of Medicare, he really broke some arms and broke some legs. But more importantly, he gave away some things in the process of lining up votes, right. including giving Wilbur Mills uh, Medicaid That's right. to pour <laughs> money into the South. So it was, a, it was more than a grand bargain. He went individually to, uh, to see what right. people want. Has politics changed so much so that presidents really, at, or majority leaders, can't offer an individual enough to be able to get their vote? You know, interest. <laughs> Somehow those discussions don't even reach that point. I mean, it did obviously in a specific issue of getting votes on the health care behind closed doors and trying to, when they were melding it together from within their own, you know, within the Democratic Party. I mean, you heard about the corn husker agreements and so on. But generally speaking, no. I mean, I just think that the ideological divide becomes such, and also the unwillingness to talk to the other side, you know, about how you can move, move ahead or forge an agreement on an issue such as health care particularly, uh, which would be a lightning rod for so many, uh, I think for so many members even within, 
the Republican ranks in both the House and the Senate that you can't even have those discussions. Now, some will say, well, you know, the elimination of earmarks <laughs> uh, hampered <laughs> uh, the ability of uh, leaders to be able to offer something yeah, for their congressional help. district or for their states that might help. But they, they did, but they did do that in many ways in the Senate uh, to draw support on some of these issues that would have mattered uh, to various senators. But the point is it never reaches the discussion where you have Republicans and Democrats sitting in room to figure out how do you solve the problem? Because it's all become an ideological lockdown even before the issue forms uh, in Congress. So we just got a budget this week. Is it thawing? <laughs> is, it is that funny? ideology or is it political expediency? Well, what's your read of what's happening well, now? They're finally, you know, they're finally getting it. Even if it's de minimis, they're finally getting it. I mean, you know, when you have polls at a 5% approval rating or 7% approval rating, you know, as one of my co colleagues said last year at the end of the session, we had 10% approval rating. He said, who exactly is that 10% that thinks that Congress is doing a good job? <laughs> well, <laughs> friends know, and neighbors, right, I guess. Right, friends and neighbors. So now it's about, you know, somewhere between, you know, 5 and 7%. That may not even include family. I, you know, I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, that's pretty dismal if you think about it, right, Don? I mean, it's, you know, it's really, it's, we're in uncharted territories. And I think they recognize, yes, they would face, you know, a backlash you know, from the public. And that's important because that has to be the incentive for the public to speak up and to engage in this process, to make sure your voices are heard so that they move, you know, legislation forward, and at least to get this budget. Um, it's, you know, now unfortunately today, success in Washington is defined by achieving the lowest common denominator, but, you know, it's a start. I mean, I think that we have to take it for what it is, but we can do better, you know, frankly. We can do better as a country. We should expect more out of our legislators. You cannot get anything done if you're not going to talk to the other side. And you're not going to get 100% of what you want. I don't know any sphere of life in which you do. Now, I realize, you know, the votes that came with Social Security and Medicare and welfare reform under Secretary Shalala's leadership, you know, had broad bipartisan support. Those types of votes are almost mythological in today's environment because it just simply doesn't happen. We've got to change that because we have to return to the point where public service is about solving problems. Okay, let me, um, let me put you on the spot and then I want to talk about some solutions. Um, the Republican leadership calls you up and says, uh, <laughs> Senator Snow, we have to write our response to the President's State of the Union message. What do we say about health care? What's your recommendation to them? What is, it, um, what is my recommendation? Um, well, we're, uh, they're willing to work, find that common ground on how to fix it. Because frankly, you know, for Republican, Republicans, the reality is that it's going to continue to remain the law. They don't, won't have the votes, even in spite of the elections or whatever happens in 2014. I mean, the president will veto the legislation. They will not have enough to override a veto. So the point is you have to move forward, is how you're going to address the inequities that exist, remedy the problems as it continues to roll out. I had, you know, I had urged the Democrats at the time, fix the problems. There are so many problems, uh, you know, having been very familiar with its content that before it became law, they thought they could address it afterwards. And I know, I guess the White House had, you know, what they call sort of um, a bill, you know, for, to address technical problems. Well, we know there are more than technical problems. In the state legislature, they used to call it errors and inconsistencies. But the notion is, is to fix problems in existing bills. And you know there always will be. But it wasn't going to happen in this environment. But I think the reality is I would address to say, these, this is how I, we would approach it. And frankly, if they're anticipating controlling the legislative branch of government, they're going to have to address and confront that question. So I think it's important 
to be proactive and identify those issues that they think they are prepared to remedy and should, because ultimately it is the law of the land. And when it is the law of the land, you've got to respect that and figure out how you're going to make it work. If we spend our time undoing what the other did back and forth, the country is not going to advance. I mean, that's changing the will of the people, frankly. The election occurred. It's now time to move forward. Um, I, I'd like you to talk a little about some of your solutions to the Washington gridlock. The one I like the most is that you clearly believe in economic incentives. And one of your recommendations it was, if we fail to pass a budget or our appropriation bills, don't pay us. Exactly. Don't you agree? That's a pretty cool idea. Yeah. I don't know how Alice Rivlin feels about that. But that's a pretty <laughs> cool idea. Yeah, no budget. Well, you know, they sort of did that this year at the beginning of the year with much fanfare, which I thought, oh, there's going to be a lot of hope. We're going to get a budget passed. Well, not exactly. <laughs> it only applied if each chamber passed a budget. It wasn't that the budget had to become law. <laughs> and so it, the, I think that we should pass no budget, no pay. If they don't pass it, and don't pass it, they're required by law to pass it on a familiar day to all of us as Americans, April 15th. We haven't had a budget in four years up until what happened in December. The largest economy in the world operating without a budget. You know what a budget's all about. It sets priorities. And right. the Congress hasn't failed to set priorities because it's failed to address the budget. It's consequential for this country. And we have to return to making them accountable. And accountability is no budget, no pay. Because we wouldn't have had a shutdown. We wouldn't have had threats of debt ceiling if they had to have passed a budget and passed the appropriation bills to fund the government. There would have been no leverage in the House to demand or to affect the shutdown. What would your next recommendation be to hold the Congress accountable? Oh, boy, I got a long list. Uh, you know, I would make them work a five-day work week. Now, you know, <laughs> you might be saying, well, that's what the rest of us do. You know, Congress works in funny fashions. It's, not, it's important to go home. And I did that, obviously, every week. But what happens now is that, well, you know, this is the least productive Congress was last year. I mean, least productive. In 1947, Truman described that Congress, the 80th Congress, as a do-nothing Congress. They passed 906 bills. The last Congress only passed 283. This Congress may be even less productive than the least productive. So it's going to be worse than it was before because, in fact, Tom Daschle was telling me yesterday, he said Congress has only, the Senate only been nine days a month this year, given their legislative schedule. The point is, five-day work week means that they stay there, concentrate on those issues, because they're too complex, have hearings, stay at the hearings. We have multiple, you know, conflicting schedules, so it gives you more time. But what happens is you have a bed check vote on Monday at 5.30. That's how we describe it. Get everybody back. By Thursday, they're smelling jet fumes, and now it's time to leave. And so nothing gets done. It simply doesn't get done. You can't focus on the major issues of our day when you think about what is out there as outstanding, that to have Congress focus on those issues and how to come up with comp solutions to complex problems, but maybe get to know your colleagues. You know, there was a story about the House of Representatives when one member of Congress was standing next to another and didn't recognize that person as a member of Congress. Now, that happens in the House of Representatives because it's larger. But in this instance, you can always imagine that it happens with regularity because the fact that they don't, aren't in session long. And that is going to be especially true both in the House and Senate uh, this year. And they passed very few laws. I think they passed 72 this year, uh, which is, again, precedent, uh, precedent setting in the sense that this is a historic law. And I think your recommendation was actually work three weeks, right. five days right. a week, and then go home for right. a week. Right. As opposed yeah. to the sort of dividing it right. up. Exactly. And if they want to go on Friday night, fine. But have votes, because as soon as we don't have votes, everybody evacuates. Because, you know, everybody has demands, and so they just look elsewhere. 
that's why I think that the country has, you know, suffered. Because none of the big issues and putting the attention to even issues like the Affordable Care Act, you know, have gotten the attention that deserves of all members of Congress, not a select few behind closed doors figuring out how to solve the problem. Every crisis that we have had in the last few years has been manufactured by Congress. It's all self-engineered. As I always say, it's like the captain of the Titanic, you know, manufacturing his own iceberg to hit. That's exactly what Congress has done, if you think about it. And so they need to be there solving these problems, not having two leaders behind closed doors cobbling something together at the last minute in the 11th hour, which is what's happened time and time again. And inevitably, you get bad policy. Oh. Um, talk about some of your other recommendations. I, we're going to have to wrap this up, but I want you yes. to, to sort of summarize how you think you can actually change both the process and maybe some of the thinking. Absolutely. I think that the dynamic is to is polarization and gridlock in Washington. What do we do to, to change all of that? Because now there are very few competitive House seats in the House of Representatives, depending on which study. Some are 21 seats out of 435 that are competitive, uh, maybe 35, according to Nate Silver. So it all depends, but that's out of 435. The National Journal said in 1982, there were 58 senators that came between the most conservative Democrat and most liberal Republican, and that there were 344 House members in that category. In the Senate today, there is zero, because the votes are so polarizing. Zero senators for the third year in a row and the fourth time ever. And the House of Representatives went from 344 to 13. I think we need to have independent redistricting commissions. I think we have to have open primaries. Uh, it's another way of diluting the ideological impact and having more centrist candidates, competitive in primaries, getting people to you know, weigh in, participate in the primaries, getting more independence to vote in primaries, independent redistricting commissions, so they're not gerrymandered. Um, and I'm on the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, a senior fellow, I co-chair the Commission on Political Reform. The Policy Center was uh, formed by uh, four former U.S. Senate Majority Leaders, Senator Mitchell, Senator Daschle, Senator Dole, and Senator Baker. And we are coming up with a series of electoral, legislative, and political reforms. We're going to launch them later this year. And we'll also have Citizens for Political Reform as an adjunct to my book. And we're going to build a national movement to actually launch these initiatives and then build support to actually get them done. Because we have to lay the groundwork for changing uh, this dynamic uh, that has really, I think, debilitated our capacity uh, to make decisions and certainly puts in jeopardy the future of this country by forfeiting the ability to solve these problems. Thank you. And let's thank Senator Snow for joining us today. I want to thank Senator Snow for her leadership over these years. It's good to know that she's going to continue to work on these issues. Um, I'd like to thank Baptist Health South Florida for sponsoring the session, and I want to thank our presenting sponsors, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Florida Blue, and all of our sponsors. And thank to all of you, and I hope to see you next year. Senator Snow, um, you've got to be everybody's role model for a great public servant. Thank you for your thank service. You. Thank you, um, And thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's my honor and privilege to be with you. Thank you all. Thank you.